government protests continue in Chile with the support of the indigenous Mapuche people. The international anti-imperialist solidarity meeting concludes in Cuba. And Lebanese people flood the streets of Beirut to protest against the ruling elite. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo. This is From the South. Anti-government protests continue to rock Chile and now the indigenous Mapuche people have ratified their support of the protests as well. A Mapuche delegation have handed over their flag to the protesters as a token of social and just social justice and resistance. The Mapuche people has long been leading social resistance in Chile due to the long history of repression against their community. Long live the Chilean people who have come out to protest against the political and economic models that have repressed and abused them. For us, this is not new. We have fought against economic and political models harming our people and our culture for more than 500 years. That is why we have come here as a symbolic act, where the Mapuche authorities give our flag to the Chilean people as an act of brotherhood and unity in this fight. A delegation of Mapuche people have come from the south of the country. We have come here to give the Mapuche flag to the people of Chile because we have seen how this flag has become a symbol of resistance for the Chilean people who reject the current economic model in the country. Hundreds of cyclists have also marched in central Santiago to reject the neoliberal policies of the government of Sebastián Piñera. The cyclists marched to Plaza Italia, which has become the focal point of anti-government protests since they had began almost three weeks ago. Despite the peaceful protests, many people reported a heavy presence of security personnel. Almost 5,000 Chileans have also gathered in the city of Valparaíso to march against the government. Though President Piñera tried to quell protests by introducing several concessions, many protesters say they are insufficient. They continue to call for Chile to hold a constituent assembly to rewrite a constitution that was approved under the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet between 1973 and 1990. After meeting with members of the Chilean Human Rights Institute, Guatemala Nobel Peace Prize winner Rigoberta Menchu says she is very concerned about the human rights violations by authorities during the ongoing protests across the country. The world is concerned about Chile for everything that has happened. Firstly, we are concerned about the police position, the way they handled the protests, because there are injured people, including children, people missing and even cases of possible sexual abuse of women. Methods that are repudiable and condemned around the world. We wouldn't like this to happen in our countries. And the counselor of the National Human Rights Institute, Consuelo Contreras, called the Chilean public minister to investigate human rights violations. As the National Human Rights Institute, we have requested expert opinions regarding the bullets and bullets that are being used. In the cases of people who have died during this period, we will request an in-depth investigation and we hope that the public ministry will do the same. In a democratic society, human rights violations must be investigated thoroughly and what had happened in the past won't be repeated, that these kind of investigations weren't in place or were done half-heartedly. So we hope that both the justice system and the public ministry will comply with the terms of democracy. The massive uprising against the neoliberal system in Chile has brought to the surface the festering wound of a country that liked to present itself as an oasis of prosperity and stability. Alejandro Kirk, our correspondent, looks back. Here everyone has a story to tell of something that kept them from sleeping, but they've been bottling up, until it occurred to someone in government to put up the Santiago subway fares by 30 pesos and school students decided not to pay. Children are like that, daring and disobedient. Then this gentleman decided to take the piss. Anyone who leaves home earlier and takes the subway at 7 in the morning can get a lower fare, so it's possible to have early risers with cheaper tickets. 
The president thought the best solution was to declare war. Estamos en guerra. We are at war with a powerful, implacable enemy who doesn't respect anything or anyone, who is ready to use violence and commit crimes with no limits. And war it was. Complete with atrocities that drew international concern. Many people have been injured. The former health minister admitted a few days ago that they were more than 30,500 injured patients. And we have registered more than 130 people with serious eye injuries. Every day we are receiving about 12 new patients with grave damage to one of their eyes. We believe that 25 people have been killed in the protest. More than 700 people have been treated in hospitals, most of them with rubber bullet wounds. There must be twice that number who don't want to go to hospital because they know that the doctors have been ordered to report all cases. So many people are afraid they could be arrested if they seek treatment. There was never any clean out of the army, the police or the state apparatus. And we are seeing the results in the repression now. We have met more than 30 human rights organizations. I coordinate human rights issues for the European left. And we've seen reports of torture, clandestine torture centers, disappeared people, rape, electric shocks and murders. What more has to happen before the world stops looking the other way, pays attention to Chile and says stop? Who was it that briefed the president on the day he said on national TV that we were at a war against a powerful enemy? Who told him that? There's a chain involved here. Someone spread that idea. Did the intelligence services tell him that? What were they preparing? Whoever it was who told Piñera about a war on criminals later told him about an unstoppable avalanche filling the streets across the country. So yesterday's vandals became citizens with genuine grievances. Given people's legitimate needs and demands, we have listened with care and humility. What the government is doing is offering minute increases in wages and pensions, but without touching the model itself. That is the political and ideological message coming from the government. But we need to change the rules of the game, and that means a new constitution, where the rules can be debated democratically by the whole society, and not just by the same old elite. The mainstream media danced to the official tune. Workers at some TV channels complained they were being fed the news by the Ministry of the Interior. The calls from the ministry are terrible. They should be ignored because they encourage self-censorship. I don't want to think that the journalist colleagues are deliberately playing along with this. But it has to do with bad journalistic practices. There are very few media today that can really open up to the citizens and understand that the center of the story now is not those small groups who carry out acts of vandalism, but the huge mass of people who have taken part in the most spectacular demonstrations this country has ever seen. Although leaderless, the torrent of demands began to coalesce. The social unity coordination made up of 70 organizations, began cautiously to take a lead. What we propose is, first, discussion of a minimum wage of not less than 500,000 pesos net, the right to collective bargaining and genuine right to strike. Three, a minimum pension equivalent to the minimum wage we are proposing. Four, price controls on basic services, including water, electricity, gas, cable and internet. 5. Decent public transport. 6. A reduced working day. 7. Improved health care, education, housing and social rights. 8. Human rights. 9. Immediate rejection of the TPP. 10. A new budget for 2020. And 11. A new constitution through a constituent assembly. Santiago is living through one of those intense, fleeting moments when reality breaks all the rules. Leaving behind all timidity, everyone wants to talk in this open city. The walls become a blackboard as community assemblies, without asking anyone's permission, draw up a new constitution. Cristian Inostroza y Alejandro Kirk, Telesur, Santiago de Chile.
Moving on to Cuba, where the anti-imperialist solidarity meeting for democracy and against neoliberalism has concluded with the approval of, of a plan against the interference of the United States and for the upholding the international law. The plan demanded an end to the economic and financial blockade on Cuba. It also expressed solidarity with the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and also called for the immediate release of former Brazilian President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro, Cuban President Miguel Miguel Díaz Canel alongside Raúl Castro and former President Salvador Sánchez Serén were among the participants of the event. Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro has addressed participants at the closing ceremony of the meeting in Havana. We have built a real alternative against neoliberalism and capitalism. We have built the answer to neoliberal policies with creativity in each country. When we had entered this hall, we heard a slogan that moved us all because it's how we feel. It said, Fidel is here. And yes, he is here in the spirit of this meeting that seeks solutions to neoliberalism in the region. President Maduro also talked about the current uprising in Chile. It is very exciting to see the awakening in Chile. It took them 18 years of dictatorship and almost 30 years after a so-called democracy that kept the same constitution as the dictator Augusto Pinochet. Such a shame. No one has ever thought of changing Chile's constitution. And now the Chilean people in the streets are the ones who are going to change the constitution. And apart from showing solidarity with the Cuban people, participants of the meeting have also come to highlight social injustices in their own countries like the United States. You know, we come here also to talk about issues of indigeneity that exist and happen within Canada, happen within the United States, um, talk about issues to do with uh, race in terms of black folks here uh, in the United States, because we have a lot of issues um, in terms of employment, in terms of police brutality, in terms of um, many other issues. And so we're here to bring that message and really uh, connect, be in solidarity with people across the world and the Cuban people, and also have, so have folks be able to share and be in solidarity with us in the United States. Coming up after the break, veteran United Tobacco Media fraternity is mourning the death of veteran sports journalist Dave Lamy. Stay with us. A special stakeholder conference to ensure the implementation of the CARICOM single market economy is set to take place on Monday. Discussions will focus on the free movements of persons, contingent rights, common external tariffs, customs and trade, and the movement of financial services. Barbados is leading the effort with the island's ambassador to CARICOM, David Commissioning, and CARICOM's Assistant Secretary General Joseph Cox, expected to address the consultation. 
That turned out in Tobago Media Fraternity is mourning the death of veteran sports journalist Dave Lammy. The 80-year-old started his career doing commentary for house horse racing and over the years became synonymous with the sport. He was awarded with the Alexander B. Champagne Award last year by President Paul Amai weeks for his lifelong service to sport. Taking his passion very seriously, he, he once advised members of the media to respect the sporting industry and be selective in their coverage. Would you believe they ran a story from England with a foul race, a race among hens? Now how can that be sport? How can you promote and project that sort of thing instead of going out there and covering local sport? There was another one, another story that was highlighted with people eating a hot dog. How many hot dogs you could eat? Is that sport? I'm appealing to the media to pay a little more attention. Moving on, the death toll arising out of the heavily repressed national strike in Ecuador has increased. This as a demonstrator succumbed to his injuries just over two weeks after the strike ended. We have more details in this report. The National Confederation of Ecuadorian Indigenous Nationalities, or CONAIE, has confirmed that another citizen has died from the Chimborazo province. CONAIE President Jaime Vargas said the man was another victim of the violent repression, adding that he succumbed to gunshot injuries to the head. Vargas also said they have substantial evidence of police violence and plan to take legal action. The Ombudsman Office has so far confirmed that 11 people were killed during the protests against the economic measures imposed by President Lenin Moreno. We feel outraged over this unfortunate death. We have lost a leader, but we will continue to fight. We will continue to do so in the province of Carchi, and we will be more united than ever. According to the Ombudsman Office, 1,340 people were injured during the national strike. Among them, Yahaira Urrest, communicator and mother of a four-year-old boy. She was injured by a gas bomb that caused her to lose her eye. In an interview with Telesur, she recounts how the events took place. The bomb hit my eye and got stuck on me. That is when the smoke started coming out. I wasn't able to hear anything. I wasn't able to scream. Meanwhile, the Ecuadorian government said 435 policemen were hurt during the protests. The president has since congratulated the police and the armed forces for their actions during the strike. In spite of the reports made by citizens and human rights organizations who have rejected the use of excessive force from security forces. We increased our forces when we noticed people were trying to enter in an aggressive manner. That is when we use gas bombs to try to disperse the crowd. The government insists that external forces, including Venezuela and former President Rafael Correa, were the ones behind the protests and had planned to destabilize the government. However, citizens and indigenous leaders condemned that the strike was a popular uprising against the economic policies of President Moreno. Now, various human rights organizations are calling on the authorities to respond to the reports of violence that occurred during the national strike. Another person was killed in the Cauca department in Colombia on Saturday. This time, the bodyguard of an indigenous leader was murdered, continuing the wave of violence in the region. Fabian Rivera Penagos was a member of the indigenous security unit known as UNP. Police say Rivera was at his girlfriend's home when an armed group entered the house and kidnapped him. His bullet-riddled body was later found in a rural area. Indigenous communities have since blocked the Pan American Highway in rejection of the killing of social leaders in the northern regions of Colombia. Illegal lodgers have attacked an indigenous group in the Brazilian Amazon rainforest, killing one young warrior and wounding another. The incident was reported by the Wahawara group that was formed to protect the forest. They've been patrolling the northern state of Maraño since 2012. The group said Paula Paulinho Wahajara was hunting inside a reservation on Friday when he was attacked and shot in the head. These kinds of clashes are becoming increasingly common under President Jair Bolsonaro, who has been dismantling environmental and indigenous agencies and has promised to open up the Amazon to development. 
Hundreds of people have gathered in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil on Saturday to pay tribute to the murdered councilwoman Mariel Franco. Her case has once again shot to the spotlight after investigative television company Rede Globo revealed possible links between Franco's death and President Jair Bolsonaro this week. The report triggered a furious response from President Bolsonaro, who called the investigative journalists scumbags and rascals. Franco, who highlighted the plight of Brazil's disadvantaged favela residents and was also an LGBTQ and women rights activist, was shot dead alongside her driver in March of last year. Moving on, Spanish students have set up a camp outside a university to show their support for the Catalan independence movement. More than 1,000 students have pitched the tents indefinitely outside the University of Barcelona to put more pressure on the Spanish government regarding the Catalan independence movement. The peaceful student camp has received support from local residents and they hope to continue until their demands are met. I'm here basically because I believe we are living under a strong repression situation in Catalonia, and the detonator of all these demonstrations in the last days and weeks has been the sentence, the imprisonment of our leaders and our ideas, and the imprisonment of all the people who voted on October 1st, no matter if they were for independence or not. Coming up after the break, Lebanese people continue to protest in the streets of Beirut against the government. Stay with us. Who's moving the chess game? What interests motivate the actors behind each event? The board is deployed there. Critical move. Investigates every event from Monday to Friday. Only on the Sur. Lebanese people continue protesting in the streets of Beirut against the government despite the resignation of the Prime Minister. Many of the protesters also rejected President Michel Aoun's attempt to position himself as the guarantor of the protest movement and its anti-corruption drive. Nationwide protests have gripped Lebanon since October 17th as the country is struggling with the worst economic crisis since the 1975-1990 civil war. Iran has again ruled out negotiations with the United States. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayotala Alali Khamei said the Trump administration is not willing to make any concessions, especially on lifting sanctions on Iran for the sake of restarting negotiations. This is just a day before the 40th anniversary of the hostage crisis at the United States Embassy in Tehran, when Iranian students in 1979 overran the embassy to demand the U.S. to hand over their overthrown ruler. Those who see negotiations with the U.S. as the solution to every problem are certainly mistaken. That's how they do negotiations. They'll say, we brought you to your knees and won't make any concessions in the end. South Africa has won the 2019 Rugby World Cup for the third time. Her correspondent, Matua Malachi in Pretoria, gives us more of the historical significance of the victory. 
The Springboks victory could not have come at a better time when South Africa is suffering from many socio-political issues like high unemployment rate and the economy that's not doing very well. But now there are celebrations in most parts of the country and we are now in Mamilodi in east of Pretoria, the capital city where there aren't a lot of celebrations here and it speaks to the politics of the rugby game here in South Africa where in, township, it's, in townships it's not as popular as it is in much more affluent areas or even in more rural areas so that is the contrast about the politics of rugby here in the country but celebrations all round and South Africans are coming together a moment that South Africa needs desperately to come together and celebrate for a change and that's what it's been happening here and the, the hoisting of that uh, well, uh, Ellis Webb uh, trophy was a moment a historic moment to say the least when we saw Sia Colisi the first black um, the captain of the Springbok team lifting that cup with President Cyril Ramaphosa in Yokohama in, in Japan and that was a moment that South Africans were looking forward to and it will be engraved in the minds of many people for the longest time because we've never seen a black captain for the rugby team, the rugby national team here in South Africa lifting that cup and it's, this is the third time now that South Africa is taking the cup, the World Cup um, and we've seen that happening in 1995 when Nelson Mandela had just become the president of a new democracy. And we saw it again in 2007 when President Tabombeki was in his second term, which he didn't finish, by the way. But right now the mood is very light and South Africans are very happy to see what we call the deboke or the spring box lifting uh, the, the, the South African flag high up there in Japan. It's back to you, Sudia. We thank Matuba for that report. At least 53 soldiers and one civilian have been killed in an army post in northern Mali. Government officials said the number of victims might change as some of the corpses were, were yet to be identified. Islamic State claimed responsibility for the attack in a report by its AMAC news agency on Saturday, but it did not cite any evidence for the claim. The Algerian election authority has announced that five candidates qualify to run for presidency in the upcoming elections. The five candidates were selected from 23 people who tried to run for the presidency but fell short of the requirements. The announcement came a day after Algerians marched for a 37th consecutive week to demand a change in the current political system. The elections are scheduled for the 12th of December. Algeria had previously cancelled their presidential election planned for July 4th, citing a lack of candidates. The result today squashes all those who doubted the capacities of the authority to organize an election, all those who doubted the possibility of going towards a free and impartial election. Landslide victims in Cameroon have been left in a state of despair as rescue works to find their missing relatives continue. Survivors of a deadly landslide which left dozens dead in Bafosam on Tuesday say they have been asked to evacuate the dangerous site but have, but have nowhere to go. Authorities have so far identified at least 43 victims, mostly women and children, but are still looking for missing people. You have seen for yourself the conditions in which we sleep. We speak with evidence and certainty. Yes, I lost my older brother and my nephew in this tragedy. There were eight of them at my older brother's house, and my nephew was at his house. There were nine of them, including a pregnant woman. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesurenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Until next time. A review of the world news that investigates, incites analysis, and induces criticism. Because every event has a context. Pusimos el punto de ahí. in the eye. Saturdays. Only on Telesur.